Hello everyone and welcome to my KSP tutorial series in Kerbal Space Program 0.90 beta. And so now Kerbal Space Program has reached the beta phase and we have all sorts of new features. And I decided it was time to provide a tutorial series for those who might want to get into the game for the first time and also for veterans who might want to brush up their skills. Not that I'm particularly great at them myself, but uh, I'm reasonably competent after making hundreds of episodes in Kerbal Space Program, I hope, uh, though some might disagree. Anyway, uh, the first thing to do in the tutorial series, I think, is to go through the settings, and so I think that's a fair way to start. Most of this stuff is standard. I'll hit upon just the ones that are things that I might have changed and I'm concerned with. First thing is displaying Earth Time. Now you can s select between Earth Time and Kerbin Time, and remember, you're playing on Kerbin. Kerbin is a much smaller planet than Earth. It's about 11 times smaller than Earth. And so it has a different period day and a different period year. Now, it's simpler for me to keep Earth time with 24 hour days and 365 day years because, frankly, I've done a lot of calculations based on that for my other series. So it's helpful for me to keep that. But you can display Kerbin time, which is a six hour day and 426 day years, that's uh, 426 of these six hour days, uh, so actually it's a year is shorter than Earth's year altogether. But uh, yep, yeah, so you can pick your own preference there, uh, keep that in mind. Max persistent debris is sort of important. You're going to end up with a lot of uh, spent stages in space, and also if you accidentally blow things up, you're going to have a lot of other debris in space. And so if you want to simulate like the movie Gravity or something like that, you can turn that up and try your best. Uh, though it's actually very hard to knock into things in space. Uh, space is a lot bigger than uh, they made it out to be in that movie. Not that I didn't enjoy the movie, by the way, I did. But uh, yeah, you can tune that up. Or if you think that uh, things are getting a little bit bad in your situation, you might want to turn that down. Uh, max Physics Delta dime Time per frame is very important. This is not frames per second. This is not graphics frames. This is physics frames. Okay, physics frames are the actual calculations that your CPU does to figure out how fast you're going, basically. Uh, stuff like that. Your altitude, all the basic variables that we're talking about when you talk about spaceflight. And so, this is how often your CPU is going to be asked to calculate it. And if the game can't get a response from your CPU every 0.04 seconds on that, it will slow down the simulation and so what's going to happen is one second of real time, maybe less than a second of simulation time, and the game will just uh, slow your rocket down, and it'll seem like your rocket is going a lot slower than it actually is, uh, because the game has decided that it's not getting a quick enough response from your CPU. Now, you might think, okay, well then I'll just turn that down, and so that the, the CPU will uh, have the time to do all the calculations, but Eventually, that's going to get to a point where you're not going to be able to control it very well because uh, you do a control input and you have to wait that time to get the calculation. And so it's going to be a little bit tricky to find the optimal there. I just leave it at 0.04 myself. And uh, probably for some of my series I shouldn't, but I, I don't want to mess with that too much. Okay, graphics, I am running at 1600 by 900 and typically I run at that and scale down to 720p. And the reason for that is because Fraps uh, sometimes crashes when I try and go from uh, screen to screen in uh, full screen mode. And so that's why full screen is disabled. And uh, yeah, I've got a 1080p monitor. So that is the situation. There's other reasons too, but I'll just leave it at that. It does allow me to get videos out a lot quicker, obviously. Um, terrain detail, you can see how I've got everything as high as I can, except for terrain scatter. Terrain scatter is just a bunch of rocks and trees that you can't collide into. And if you really want to make uh, really uh, spectacular views, maybe you want to add those in. Uh, though, yeah, uh, you, you're going to have to play around with that. Okay, you can see the rest of the stuff, light counts, shadow cascades. You can tune those up if you've got a lot of lights going on. Uh, my controls, the only difference is the joystick. And so I do play with a control stick and uh, throttle axis is inverted. I do have a throttle and that helps a lot. So, yep, those are there. Otherwise, everything else is uh, what the stock configuration is. Audio, I have it very low because I'm recording. And uh, actually, if I tune these up, they overwhelm my voice quite easily. 
And so I'm actually going to turn the music off uh, once I press accept because uh, when I do the cuts, the edits, the music tends to be in a bad place and it gets a little bit choppy. So I'm going to add that in, but otherwise everything else is pretty standard stuff. Okay, and so with that, let's uh, go on to the game. So when starting a new game, you have a series of choices. And you have Sandbox, Science, and Career Mode. This is going to be a multi-mode series. I'm going to be jumping between Sandbox and Career. Okay, and so uh, I'm going to start in Career now. And so I'm going to name this YouTube Career. And I'm going to try and make it clear when I uh, go from one to the other so that you can follow along. That will be pretty obvious because we're going to be doing things crazy in Sandbox. Well, not crazy as in dangerous, crazy as in very inventive, hopefully. Uh, and we're going to be a little bit more restrained in career because we're going to have a lot of constraints. And I'm going to be in hard mode career. Uh, that means that you can't revert flights, means you don't get any uh, mulligans, you can't uh, start over again without any penalty. You can't quick load, uh, missing crews do not respawn, you don't auto hire crew members, we'll talk about that. Uh, no entry purchase required on research. So basically you're going to have to pay for all your parts even after you've researched them. Uh, I'll explain that when we get to that. Uh, your facilities in hard mode are destructible and you can't use the stock vessels that come with KSP. So for the other modes, uh, really the only one that you can use the stock vessels is easy. So anyway, otherwise uh, for all the others you're going to have to build your own. Oh, did I mention that this game is about building your spacecraft and launching little guys called Kerbals into space? I, I should do that. Okay, uh, career options. Starting funds, 10,000. Pretty meager. Starting science, zero. Starting reputation. These are the three things that you're going to be watching out for so that you can make sure that you can keep launching rockets. Otherwise, you are going to run out of funds, science, and reputation in order to do things that you want to do. So you got to watch out for those. And most of your mission stuff is going to be trying to accumulate these things. I'm going to have less rewards due to the missions and greater penalties if I fail the missions. Okay, so with that, let's go on. Okay, this is a new blurb actually for this version. And it tells you that you can look around like this, you can zoom in, and you can right click over the facilities to upgrade them in particular. Right now, we can only support 30 parts, so we're going to want to upgrade that. Uh, we can only launch uh, space planes with 30 parts, and we can only have them be 18 tons. Our launch pad can only support 18 ton craft. Our tracking station has a lot of features that it does not have available to us right now. We can only have a science limit of 100 and we can only have five Kerbonauts, okay? And uh, they cannot EVA. They cannot do extravehicular activities, also known as spacewalks. So can't do that right now. Okay, I got all that. This is all new for this version. Originally, we just had stuff that existed and they didn't have any limitations on them. But now you have to upgrade your facilities and they do have limitations. And so these are the basic facilities but you have to upgrade them and they'll look a lot better once you do okay the first place to uh, stop by is probably the mission control here and that will give you your contracts so here we see the contracts and right now we have a maximum of two because we haven't upgraded the building yet and so I'm going to pick up launch a new vessel and set an altitude record of 5,000 meters, the basic sort of things. So we're going to try and launch somebody to 5,000 meters. I say somebody because right now we don't have probe parts. All we have is a capsule, engine, solid rocket bo booster, not booster, booster, fuel tank, girder segment, antenna, and parachute. That's it. Eventually we will get uh, probe parts so that we can control the craft without a Kerbal in. But right now we cannot do that. So we will be launching somebody on all of our missions. So that screen we were in was the Research and Development Building. 
Uh, astronaut complex you don't need for now. Space plane hangar you definitely don't need for now, unless you're really adventurous. But actually, I don't think with the parts. I mean, we don't have wings or anything, so we'll have to wait a while for that. So let's go to the VAB. Okay, in the VAB we are greeted by Werner von Kerben. I I don't know why. You know, in hard mode they should probably just uh, not have this display because I think we've we we've got it. Okay, um, you're going to start with a command pod. And in fact, that's all I'm going to start with for a sec. Uh, let me launch this. Now this costs 600 funds. That's the unit of, of money in all this. And we have 11,376 funds. But right now I'm going to launch it. This is where you pick your crew. And right now we're just going to go with Jeb Kerman. So let's go out to the launch pad and I'll show you how to do some basic science. Now, once you take a craft out to the launch pad, that uh, the cost of it gets deducted from your funds. So you see, now we've lost that 600, but that's fine. We're going to be recovering this pretty quickly. Okay, the first thing I want to do is a crew report, and that gets us only 0.9 science. But we haven't gone very far. We're on the launch pad, so we'll keep that data. Now we can't EVA. We can't do a spacewalk, but we can have him EVA here because it is still the ground. And so he is uh, doing a simulated spacewalk on the ground and we are going to have him do a report about that and that gets us a great uh, 3.4 science. Very important. Let's keep that data. Can we do anything else? Well, let's uh, have him go off. EVA report? Ah, well, you can only carry one EVA report at a time. So, what we're going to have to do is have him stow that back in. So here I'm going to grab it and he's going to board the vessel and you can't quite see it. Uh, there you go. It says EVA report while flying over Kerbin Shores stowed uh, or stored. And now when we step off I ask him not to be flying quote unquote flying. He was just a little bit off the ground but it counts as flying. Uh, now that he's not flying, we can do another EV report, and this is different. This only cost one, uh, only gives us 1.4 science, and it's actually from the launch pad surface, and so we get to keep that data. Now, previously, you were able to do a surface sample. I don't know if they'll be able to do that with uh, upgrades or something like that, but uh, maybe, maybe only a scientist. Uh, Jeb here is a pilot. And so scientists uh, can do other things. I haven't discovered that yet. There are a lot of new features in beta that I haven't actually caught up with. But for now, one thing I know what to do, we've done our science, and so I'm going to recover vessel. Okay, so once you've recovered your vessel, you get your 600 funds back, and our science is recovered. We got 5.7 science for that. Parts are recovered. Since it was at the launch pad, it was for 100% of the total value. But if you end up somewhere else, like halfway around the world, it will be less than that. So we wouldn't get our full 600 funds back if we landed somewhere else. Even a few kilometers away, it'll give you a deduction. So if you want your full value of your craft back in funds, you have to return it to the launch pad. That's going to be a lot of fun. And of course, we get our crew back. And Jeb got one experience point, and let's go to the astronaut complex to see what that's all about. So here, that this is also new for beta, the, the Kerbinauts get experience points, and those go towards giving them additional skills. And so right now, we've, he's got stability assist, but he will develop other skills as he becomes a more experienced pilot. Bill here will get more skills in terms of repairing broken parts as he becomes a more experienced engineer and Bob will become better as a scientist. Okay, and so we'll see what all that's about further on. Now we did pick up those contracts and we haven't actually launched a vessel yet. And so I'm going to just launch, even if you didn't do the pad science that I did just now, this is basically the the straightforward vessel you should launch. Here's the logic behind it. The first thing you, you're going to want to make sure is that this thing can get off the ground. And the way you do that is notice the thrust of the, of the engine you're using, or engines, sum them all up. This says 250. 
that's 250 kilonewtons, but you don't have to worry about the units for now. Uh, what that means is that if you divide that by gravity, and gravity on Kerbin is the same as that on Earth at the surface. Altogether it's not uh, when you take into account how small Kerbin is, but at the surface the acceleration is the same. So you take that number, divide it by gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. Again, you don't need to worry about the units. Uh, so 250 divided by 9.81, and that's how many tons you can lift. Uh, so 9.81 is pretty close to 10. And so the normal going rate is to say 10, but that's, that's the minimum amount that you, that's the maximum amount you can lift in terms of tons. And so you're not going to get very quick on that. You're going to want a little bit of buffer. So uh, one thing to do might be to divide this number by 12 and then you'll get a decent uh, liftoff rate and you won't be, you won't be horrible at uh, just hovering over the launch pad all day. Okay, so, but basically our capacity is 25 tons. That's the maximum this rocket will be able to lift. Its own mass is 3.7475. Let's say 3.75. The pod is 0.84. Okay, and I'm just going to round off. I'm going to say 4.75 now. And I'm going to say that the parachute 0.1, okay, 4.85. So this is all 4.85 tons a lot less than the 25 tons that this rocket can, this uh, SRB, the solid rocket booster, can lift. So we're good on that. We're going to get off the ground. The next thing we need to worry about is whether the parachute can carry us back down. Now, this is all going to have to come back down together because we don't have decouplers. So we're going to have to bring it all back down. And that's why I didn't use this engine. You might wonder, we've got all these parts now. We've got a fuel tank. And we've got an LVT-30 liquid fuel engine. But one thing you'll notice is that even though this is heavier than that combination, the fuel tank and the engine, the engine is 1.25, fuel tank is 1.125, so they're about uh, 2.375 tons altogether. So this is heavier. So wouldn't it be better to put this on our parachute? Well, no, because that's the full mass. Empty empty this is only 0.5 roughly that's actually yeah it's it's pretty much 0.5 so 0.5 tons on the other hand empty this engine doesn't lose any mass so it's its full 1.25 tons and then this uh, tank is uh, one, uh, 0.125 empty so altogether this weighs a lot more empty than this does so it's safer to put this combination on for our parachute. Now this is staging and we don't want these two things to stage at the same time because that would mean that this engine would light and our parachute would deploy at the same time and you are not going to get very far like that. Okay I'm not going to name this rocket because this is pretty basic and we don't need to save it but we could name it and save it if we had a lot of work that got put into it but this this we did not put much work into. All right. So let us launch. Here we are on the launch pad with Jebediah Kerman. And the first thing you're going to want to do is press T for SAS. That is stability. And, and there are very few occasions where you don't want that helping you out with stability. And launch is one of the occasions where you always want it helping out with stability. Unless you have a very good reason that, you know, like uh, you have a rocket that you just know that whatever algorithm SAS is using, it's not helping you out launching the rocket. And usually you'll find that out when the rocket explodes with SAS engaged. Okay, but uh, in stock, that will probably not happen. Uh, uh, it will not be SAS's fault. Okay, so Jebediah Kerman. Jebediah Kerman has IVA as well. This is the in-cockpit view. Uh, right now, it's not particularly great. He's only got this one little window. But in theory, you could fly this thing from the in-cockpit view. Okay, this is radar altitude, this is altimeter, this is your nav ball. And so you could do that. And you can change between this view and the outside by pressing C. Okay, but so we'll take it from out here. And right now, you'll note that we are pointing straight up. And once we ignite the engine, we get this little marker. 
that is your prograde marker. That indicates the direction that you are currently moving in. Because a spacecraft can turn away from the direction it is moving in and still continue in that direction, it's important to have that little marker there to make sure you know where you're actually going. And so that's a prograde marker. The opposite of it, the opposite of the direction you're moving in, is the retrograde marker. If you want to increase your speed in the current direction, then you just point at the prograde vector and burn. But if you want to change your direction, I don't want to be going straight up, you can turn away from your prograde marker and eventually the prograde marker will, will adjust to your new vector. Okay, so now our engine is out. We have definitely fulfilled the contract for launching a new vessel and setting an altitude record of 5,000 meters. Jeb is thrilled. And now it's all a matter of getting back down safely. We could get a crew report from up here. So we're flying over Kerbin Shores, 2.1 science. Keep that data. And eventually what's going to happen is our velocity is going to go down. This is velocity. Oh, uh, that's a good point. Uh, velocity is a vector. That means it points in a direction. It's like wind velocity. Wind velocity not only has the speed, which is the 22 miles an hour or whatever, it's also got a direction, which is like northwest. So you say the wind is going 22 miles an hour northwest. Uh, that's velocity. Speed is just the 22 miles an hour. It's the magnitude of the vector, magnitude of the velocity. And so we've got an actual direction of our velocity, which is where the prograde vector is going. And as we lose the velocity, we are going to start going back down. And now the prograde vector is pointing down. This is our retrograde vector, the one with the x through it. And that means that we are now pointed opposite the direction that we are actually going in. We are actually going down. We are pointed up. And so and that's generally how you want to go down unless uh, you're a plane. Uh, when you're a plane, when you're going down, you still point in that direction, uh, general direction. You might want to point a little bit higher than that. Okay, but we are headed for the water here. We're headed quite quickly. I don't think we'll pass the speed of sound. Now, if you're used to miles an hour, you and actually if you're used to any common units like kilometers per hour, uh, you might not be used to uh, this unit, meters per second. Uh, one meter per second is roughly two miles an hour. You can go with that. That's 2.2, I think. Uh, but in general, a uh, more useful benchmark is to note that at around uh, 10 kilometers, the speed of sound, Mach 1, is 300 meters per second, or 303, I believe. So we didn't pass the speed of sound. Well, you'll see, note that our velocity is actually dropping. And that is because of the thickness of the atmosphere. We have reached terminal velocity, which means we cannot go down any faster than a certain amount because of the density of the atmosphere. And so it's actually slowing us down. That's going to be a very important property as we try and slow spacecraft down when they're reaching other planets, for instance. We're going to want the atmospheres to help us to slow down so that we don't have to do it ourselves. But this is not going to slow us down enough. We are still going to smash into the ground, so parachute. And once you deploy parachute, you can disengage SAS because the parachute will guide you to your retrograde marker so that you're oriented properly. Now the parachute has pre-deployed here, you can see, but it hasn't fully deployed. It will fl fully deploy at 500 meters. Oh, physical time warp, that's a good point. When you're waiting for something like this to happen, you might want to do physical time warp. And that means that uh, you are actually, uh, well, you're time warping in the atmosphere, but, but while doing the physical calculations. There's a different type of time warp that you do when you're in space that doesn't do the physical calculations, you know, that 0.04 second delay thing. Uh, that won't be doing those calculations. And that means that the simulation is on rails. Okay, we have parachute deployment, and occasionally you'll see my timer here go yellow or red. And that means that the simulation is being slowed somewhat. Right now it's pretty close to one second to one second. But as we get larger craft, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be worse than that. And while I was doing physical time warp, of course, it wasn't able to keep up. Okay, splashdown.
There you go. Yes, you can make submarines in this game, for those who just started wondering that. Okay, let's have the... Well, I guess I want him on the side here. Hold on. Okay, uh, that's a interesting point. Uh, I'm turning the... <clears throat> Sorry about that. I'm turning the vessel using the torque that is embedded in this command pod. That is unrealistic. Uh, the way we're turning the vessel is not something that real spacecraft would be able to do. But uh, thankfully, because it makes things a lot easier, your vessels will all have a little reaction wheels in. And those reaction wheels are little spinny objects that uh, help produce torque that will spin the spacecraft in the opposite direction that they're spinning in because of conservation of angular momentum. Okay, let's EVA... Yeah, I think we already got a crew report. Let's EVA Jeb here. So remember we had done... Oh, he's gonna drift off. Okay, remember uh, we had done over Kerbin Shores, but I think we can do another EV report here. Oh, this is still the shores. Ah, I could have sworn we would have gotten the water. Okay, uh, these are biomes, by the way, and some, some science, some EV reports, and some other science we do will be biome dependent. And so this this science is biome dependent. It specifies a particular uh, biome. Uh, some are not as biome dependent. Some of them decide which biomes they would like to be dependent on. Uh, barometers in particular are not very friendly to me. But yeah, so if we had gotten further out, we would have gotten over uh, Kerbin's water. And in that case, we would have gotten more science for it. Okay, reset that board. And let's just recover vessel. Okay, we have five more science to work with. We got 97.8% of the total value of our parts. And of course, uh, you might wonder why I didn't try and bring the thing back down to the launch pad. And of course, the reason was because I was trying to get the science from Kerbin's water and didn't quite make it out there enough. But yeah, we got uh, a lot of our funds back. That's fine. And uh, Mr. Kerman has returned to us. They're all Mr. Kerman as far as I know, so, yep, uh, you're gonna, the best to just go with first name basis on that case. All right, with all the science, I say all the science, it's not much actually, uh, we should go to the research and development building to see what we can unlock. And, uh, well, uh, you don't have very much choice in the beginning of this. You should probably unlock basic rocketry. Unlock. Now. In the difficulty menu, we had talked about uh, there was an option for whether or not you have to pay to unlock parts, and in this case, you do because this is hard mode. And so I've got these parts, and you see the cost of unlocking them in particular. I'm eventually going to need all of these, so I'm just going to unlock all of them. Uh, it costs us a bundle, though. Now, we don't have enough signs for these other technologies. So we're going to have to wait a while to do all that. Let's go to the contract screen because we filled our two contracts and we need some more. Here's Gene Kerman, named after Gene Krantz, by the way. And we have a selection of various possibilities. We can perform visual surveys of Kerman. Or we can start setting altitude records. I think we should aim for, for the altitude record and escaping the atmosphere first. Forming visual surveys are a little bit more precision work, and we'll get to that. Now, one thing you'll notice is that when they ask you to test stuff like this parachute, uh, they want that test to happen in a specific altitude and speed. So that's tricky business. You have to make sure to hit that altitude and speed when you're activating the parachute. And in this case, it's not worth very much. You only get 150 funds out of it and 12 points of reputation. Whereas if you fail, meaning that you overrun the cont contract duration without actually completing it, well, 106 days is a long time. So you have plenty of time to complete it, and it's not likely you'll, that you'll fail. But uh, failure is five, costs you 500 funds and a lot of reputation. It's really not worth my time. And so you can uh, get rid of the contract and see if there's something better and usually there isn't. Usually they give you something very similar to that. And uh, what contracts you get is based on how far into the game you are and uh, what your reputation is. So if you've only done what we've done so far, these are the kind of contracts you're going to end up getting. Uh, things change dramatically once you start getting into orbit. 
but we're not there yet. What we need to do first is to get into space. And we can't do that with this. We already seen that. We got to we got to about 15 kilometers, I think. But not too high. So what we need, we will need the liquid fuel engine this time, but what we need most of all is the coupler. Remember, the, what, the limiting factor on the previous thing was the amount that the parachute could bring back down. Now, if we have a decoupler, the parachute only has to bring the capsule back down, and this will separate off everything else. And that will help out so that we don't have to worry about carrying everything else with us into orbit, or, uh, or back down for that matter. Um, now... What engines do we have? We only have the LVT-30. Let's do a little bit, bit of an experiment. Wow, well, it's a costly experiment. We, we're a little bit tight on funds. The early stage is really tough with the funds. Uh, it's actually a pretty difficult learning curve in terms of that, if you're playing hard mode. But I guess if you're in hard mode, you've already done the learning. So probably all right. But uh, yeah, it actually gets easier over time when it comes to the constraints that you're working against. Um, let's see if this rocket can get off the ground doing the math. So 215 divided by 10 means that we can carry 21.5 tons. Uh, the capsule plus, plus parachute plus decoupler is about one ton. We can just estimate it like that. And, um, and then we've got the fuel tanks. These are all 2.25 tons. And so four of them is nine tons and then 1.25 tons so 10.25 11.25 so 11.25 altogether this thing has a thrust weight ratio of nearly two that is uh, the weight is actually the tons times gravity and so in this case uh, 11.5 tons times that 9.18 9.81 I mean uh, so that's uh, approximately 115 in terms of its weight and the thrust is 215, so it's nearly a 2 to 1 ratio between the thrust to the weight. Okay, so again, weight is, is the mass in tons times gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay, so this thing will get off the ground. As long as you have a thrust weight ratio of more than 1, you will get off the ground. And so this is fine. The question is whether it's going to reach space or not. Now, with a thrust weight ratio of so much, and because we have a thrust weight ratio of nearly two, I think I can add a few more fuel tanks. But how tall can I make this rocket before it tips over and falls on the launch pad? Let's go there. Okay. Now, what, at the end, we're going to lose all of this, right? So we're going to lose most of this 6,000 funds. And we're hoping that our contracts are going to make up that difference. And so we're going to make the money back. But it's a tricky business. And so be careful about your funds. For now, I'm, I'm okay with it. Let's go. So this time we're just aiming for space. We are not trying to get into orbit. That's a big difference, by the way. Space is 70 kilometers. So as long as you get to an altitude of 70 kilometers in the game, you're in space. Around Earth, it's a little bit trickier to determine where space starts, but generally 100 kilometers is considered the place. Orbit is a lot more different. I mean, it's a lot more difficult, and we'll get to that. Uh, this would not be able to get to orbit. It will get to space. Uh, in real life, this is the equivalent of, if it works, is the equivalent of the Mercury Redstone missions. There's, there was only two of those, and those were considered suborbital missions. So. Reaching space, but not reaching orbit, suborbital. Here we go. Suborbital, all you have to go, do is go straight up and straight down. So, no big worries. Engines in this game have 100% reliability, so we're not worried about our engines suddenly dying out. If you don't want that, if you want some random engine failures, you can add that. There are mods. There are mods for everything in this game. There are mods for turning Kerbin into Earth. 
There are mods for turning the entire solar system into uh, uh, so the the Kerbin Kerbal solar system into our solar system. There are mods for having re-entry heat, which this does not have. You'll notice that this does not have clouds. There are mods for that. There are mods for all sorts of parts. You don't like uh, airplane parts that come with the game? Fine. There are mods for that as well. Uh, you will eventually hit a situation where um, you're going to run out of RAM space because the way the game loads all these mods in, it loads everything in right at the same time at the beginning of the game. And so it shoves it all into your RAM, your random access memory, and that means that... Oops, sorry, I had to uh, cough for a second there. Uh, as I was saying, that means that you're going to hit a limit, the 32-bit limit, as we fulfill one of our contracts here. Um, the game is currently 32-bit in this version, and then there's a 64-bit unstable version. And what you're going to do is you're going to hit the 32-bit limit, which means the game can only access 4 gigabytes of your RAM, regardless of how much RAM you have in 32-bit. And so what you're going to want is, of course, 64-bit, but because 64-bit is unstable, you can't... Uh, it's a give and take. So 64-bit can use all of your RAM. 32-bit can only use 4 gigabytes of RAM. The game stock already uses about 2 gigabytes of RAM. The more mods you use, the more RAM you're going to take. Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, we have reached space. I can cut the engine now. We don't need to uh, go crazy on this. Now, Jeb can't step out. You can see we need to upgrade the astronaut complex for that. And so all we can do really in terms of science right now is crew report. So we're three science. We'll keep that. And yeah. Now because we went straight up, and the planet is still rotating underneath us. It's rotating eastward. We are going to end up west of the Space Center. And so we're going to see that. This is the map view. I didn't go into this in the previous mission. But uh, the map view shows you your current uh, orbit. It'll do a lot more if you upgrade the tracking center. And so right now we can't click on our orbit, otherwise uh, once we upgrade the tracking center we can click on our orbit and uh, we would be able to create maneuvers. And that will allow us to plan ahead, but right now we cannot plan ahead. All we're doing is going way up high and then straight back down again. This is, this is non-physical time warp now. So, physical time warp is limited to 4x, but what this means is the game has figured out your trajectory here. You can see it's figured out that, and it doesn't need to ask the CPU every single second or every single fraction of a second where you're going to be. This is uh, also known as being on rails. So, the simulation is on rails, and it is not asking the CPU every fraction of a second where you're going to be. And as expected, we're going to end up west of our, our launch complex. You'll note, again, it, it showed this little arc, but again, the planet has rotated. Don't forget the planet rotating. Very important. The mission time is, has been 18 minutes. The planet does a full rotation in 6 hours, right? Okay, we're going to end up around here. We really don't need the rest of this rocket, and if we carry it back down with the parachute, that's not going to be good. We will descend too quickly. The parachute will not be able to bear the mass, and so we need to decouple it. And I think it's okay to do so. Yep. In real life, this is not how you want to re-enter. This would be very dangerous and kill real people. And it will kill real people for numerous reasons. First of all, re-entry heat, which is not in the stock game, but you can add in if you want to with a mod. And uh, it does have the re-entry heat effects, which you can see there.
but it doesn't have the actual reality of re-entry heat. Also g-forces, you saw g-forces spiking beyond 15 g's, that can also kill people. Gotta take SAS off so that we reorient towards the parachute. The explosions you heard were of course the rest of the rocket uh, impacting on the ground somewhere. But we are safe. So I'm going to do physical time warp now. In the atmosphere you can only do physical time warp. Okay, we're on the ground. Zoom in. Get Jeb out because this is the ground. And I think we can do EV report over highlands. New biome. Keep the data. And again, we can only do one EV report at a time. So we have to board. EV again. Have him go down. Walk around a bit. EV report, and uh, yes. You'll have to forgive me for not reading the blurbs that come up with the reports, but uh, I have read those so many times that I'm not going to do it again. Alright, uh, I'm going to recover vessel here. And so we have fulfilled two more contracts, and we have gotten a bundle of science, 12.6 science here. Uh, we've gotten uh, 92.5 percent of the full value of the pod but not the full value of the rocket because we disposed of most much of the rocket and so we lost some funds in that respect but we're all right and Jeb didn't gain any experience from being in space I'm shocked oh well looks like getting experience is gonna be a lot tougher than I thought it would be all right I guess that's fine sort of okay let's move on I think this is a good place to conclude this episode and we're going to just unlock this technology, survivability. Sounds like a good thing to unlock and I'm going to leave it there. In the next episode we're going to take a look at those little surveys that we were supposed to do on Kerbin and also getting into orbit. But uh, for now I think uh, I'll keep the episodes relatively short and hopefully people can follow along like that. All right, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial in Kerbal Space Program. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And also questions, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.